7 this morning, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter number 7. Rocks and sand and rags and leaves. It's a good title, isn't it, Brother Bruce? Amen. <laughs> Rocks and sand and rags and leaves. Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount closes with a solemn warning. Basically, the danger of profession without possession. That is, religion without saving faith. Now, I... As we look right here in uh, verse number 13, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And I wish this wasn't in the Bible, but it is. And the Bible's true. It says few. Wish it said many, don't you? Few there be that find it. Not because it's hard, but because people are depending on something they can do rather than what Christ has done. Right. And they, it, it's, it's hard to get past those preconceived notions of what I have to do. Tradition has taught me for so long that I have to do something, go through a plan, say a group of collective words, and beg and plead and walk an aisle. It's just hard to fight through that. It says few there be that fight. So we have two ways. We have two trees in verse number 15 through 20. Two professions in verse number 21 through 23. And the latter part of the chapter, verse 24 through 29, is two foundations. Now if you'll notice in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, a lot of people who thought they were going to heaven did not go to heaven. Is that what you get in verse number 21? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. There's a lot of people in churches today that think they're going to heaven, that think they're going to heaven. The Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter number 5, it says, search the Scripture. Search the Scripture, for in... Them, you, and it uses the word think, you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. What it is, is we keep, according to Matthew 15, we, we keep putting our preconceived notions ahead of thus saith the Lord. You, you see, it, it goes on to say here in verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, in what day? At the day of the great white throne judgment you'll find recorded over in, in Revelation chapter 20. It says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And that's very strange that Jesus Christ would call all of those good works iniquity. What did they, what did they do in verse number 22? They preached in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name they cast out devils according to verse 22. Look at the Bible. Matthew 7, 22. Everyone needs to see it. And they went as far as to say that in Jesus' name, they did many wonderful works. And the Lord Jesus said in verse 23, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He called their good works iniquity. Any work that you think you can do to gain audience with God is works of iniquity. And their works that need to be repented of, according to the book of Hebrews. Now, religion is not righteousness. And righteousness, God's righteousness, is what you need to go to heaven. Romans chapter 10, 
Paul said that his brethren after the flesh was going about to establish their own righteousness rather than receive the righteousness of God. And then it tells the righteousness of God is Jesus Christ. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So religion is not righteousness. Religion found in the book of James is to keep yourself unspotted from the world and visit the fatherless and the widows. That's what pure religion and undefiled is. But religion is not righteousness. And preaching is not proof of godliness. You see, a man, a man may be a minister because the vocation provides a means of sustenance. He may be following his father's footsteps. He may value the prestige which accompanies the calling. Jesus affirmed that they might just be the blind leading the blind. You see, I'm convinced that some people are just preaching what they've heard. And they don't have any attention, intentions of hurting anyone. But rather than getting in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, finding out what thus saith the Lord, they preach what they've heard. I wonder how many in this congregation in the past have done the same thing. You just preach what you've heard. We preach that there was a program. We preached a specific road that, that we could take you down if you would adhere to this road and repeat some words then you could get in the family. And we cross that off as being the gospel. But what we've done, what we've done in tradition, I don't say we've done it here, but what basically we've done in churches is we've created our own gospel. You see, the Bible tells us specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 1 through 5 that the gospel, in a nutshell now, the, the crux of the gospel is that Jesus died According to, to, to what? According to the Scriptures. And so if we go back in the Scriptures and find out why Jesus had to die, we go back to the sacrificial animals, then we get to the book of Hebrews and we find out that Jesus' sacrifice was better than that of the animals. It was once and for all. Where the animals had to be repeated once a year. So He died according to the Scriptures. Why? Because it was a blood sacrifice that appeased to God. Did you know that God killed some innocent animals and clothed Adam and Eve? It was a principle all the way from the beginning of time. Jesus appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself, according to Hebrews 9.26. So He died according to the Scriptures. He was buried. That was proof that He died. And then the Bible says he rose again according to the Scriptures and was seen. Now that's the gospel. That is the gospel in a nutshell. That's the crux of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We research why he died and how he rose again. We understand that who he is, God required perfection and God judged Christ for our sins. Jesus is perfect. God is satisfied with the payment of Christ. We believe that we get in the family. That's the gospel. The gospel, and then you believe the gospel, you're in the family. But we have manufactured, we've manufactured our own gospel. I say we, talking about Christendom in general. And I know this is true, and you'll have to agree, if you've picked up any track whatsoever and read it, you know that this is true. Now, we don't have any tracks to say it. We've made up our own tracks. But it'll, at the end, it'll tell you, it'll give you a collection of words to repeat and ask God to do something. So what we've done in Christendom is we've remanufactured a new gospel or manufactured a new gospel. We said the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and a prayer. Are y'all following me? Where, where, where did I have the right? Where did I have the right to, to, to add the prayer on there? I don't have that right. Not according to Romans chapter number 3, we're justified freely by His grace. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever what? Believeth in Him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. So we believe Christ. Now, again, I believe some people are just preaching what they've heard. Now, don't misunderstand me. God does have preachers. He does have His faithful preachers. But they're not religious ornaments adorning a church. And they do not spend all their time in recreational pursuits nor political activities. True preachers have one hand on the throne of God and the other on the hearts of needy men and women. A true preacher preaches the gospel, thus saith the Lord. A true preacher can plan in water. But a true preacher realizes, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that God gives the increase. I don't need to help God get a man's name on a church roll. All I have to do is to preach the gospel and God does the rest of the work. Amen? Now that's why few there be that find it. Few there be that find it is because people are still wanting to put themselves in the equation of the gospel. What do I have to do to be saved? When the Philippian jailer asked Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What was Paul's answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And Paul expounded to him, of course, the gospel. The Philippian jailer believed him. All right, now, let's get to the latter part of the sermon right here. Rock and sand. In verse number 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine. For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Well, the latter part of the sermon deals with the two builders, as we just read in verse number 24 to verse number 29. Jesus did not mention the contractor. Jesus did not mention the carpenter or how effectively the house was constructed. But He did mention two foundations. One on the rock and one on the sand. The one on the rock in Matthew chapter number 7 and 20, verse number 24 and verse number 25. Now it's interesting to note that the first time in Scripture that the rock was mentioned, over in the book of Exodus chapter number 17 and verse number 6, the Bible says this, you remember when the Hebrew children came out of Egyptian bondage and they went through the wilderness and they were thirsty and they began to murmur and cry for water and God gave Moses instruction. Here is a perfect picture of the smitten Savior. The Bible says in verse number 6, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. What God was teaching the children of Israel is that Jesus Christ would die for the sins of the entire world. And then of course we get over to Numbers chapter number 20 and verse number 8. And God told Moses to speak to the rock. They were thirsty again. He said, speak to the rock. But Moses, out of anger, do you remember what he did? He smote it again. My dear friend, Moses never entered into the promised land. Oh, Moses was a saved man. 
but he never entered into Canaan because he smote the rock when Jesus said, speak to the rock. Now that's very important. Let me show you over here in the book of Hebrews, if you will. Take your Bibles and go over here to Hebrews chapter number 9 and chapter number 10. Jesus Christ is smitten only one time. Amen. Only one time. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 9 that we've already read in verse number 26. Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of of himself. He died one time and one time only. And look at verse number 10 of Hebrews chapter 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What Jesus did on Calvary is to the entire world. But he's only smitten one time. He died one time for sin. Verse number 12 of Hebrews chapter 10. But this man, after he, had offered, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Look at verse 14. For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 17 and 18, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. There is no more offering for sin because He died once for sin. Sin is taken care of. So we find that Jesus Christ is our rock. All the way from the first mention, all the way through Scripture. Smitten only once. He is our rock. In Daniel chapter number 2, in verse number 45, Jesus is that stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and one day will fill the whole earth. What's He going to do? That stone with, uh, carved out of the mountain without hands is going to smite the Gentile world powers and set up His kingdom. Amen? What a great rock. Jesus is our rock. Did you know according to Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 18, the church is built upon the solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon Himself He built His church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the rock. He's a chief cornerstone. He's a sure foundation. And the same cry still goes out today in John chapter number 5 and verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth My word and believeth on Him that sent me hath everlasting life. John chapter number 1, verse number 12, But to as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. It's all about Jesus Christ. He's our rock. Build your house upon the solid rock. And then we look at sand. we got rocks and sand, rags and leaves. The sand, only a foolish man would begin to build upon the sand. Now, the first mention of foolish people mentioned in the Bible is over in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 32. In Deuteronomy chapter number 32, and um, verse number 1, the Bible says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as rain in my speech. My speech shall distill as the dew is small. That's not what I want to go to. Can y'all figure that out already? Amen. Y'all find it. Nevertheless, we find the first mention of foolish people in the book of Deuteronomy. How's that? In the book of Deuteronomy, foolish people refuse to hear the word of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. People establishing their own righteousness build their house upon a sand, 
the most foolish place in the world to build your house is go down here on uh, Navarre Beach right out toward the end and put your house up. That's a foolish thing to do. What we need to do is go inland, dig the foundation deep. Put it in deep so that the house will stand. But if you'll notice in verse number 27 of Matthew chapter 7, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I've often wondered, I wonder if you have as well, why the Lord put that in there and great was the fall of it. Why didn't He just say it fell? Great was the fall of it. But let me tell you why it was so great. Hold your place in, in Matthew 7 and turn over here to the book of Philippians. Turn over here to the book of Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to show you why it was great. In the book of Philippians chapter number 3, the Bible says this, beginning in verse number 4. Paul said, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul is giving his credentials. He said, if there's, if there's any man that could ever trust in the flesh, you're looking at him. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I thought that was noteworthy that he put that in there because the first king came from the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul was giving his credentials, his heredity. He said, after the flesh, he said, I'm the best there is. He said, I kept all of the law. My father kept it for me when I was too young to keep it. I was of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee. Paul was very ultra conservative. Gave exactly what he believed defining himself as a Pharisee. He said concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. If there was any man on the face of the earth that kept the law to the best of his ability, you're looking at him. But I ask you, my dear friend, is the best of your ability enough? It's not enough, is it? I've had people come up to me and say, well, the best that I know how, I trusted Christ. Friend, the best that you know how is not good enough. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs chapter 14 says that, and Proverbs chapter 16 says it as well. The reason the house the Lord spoke of in Matthew chapter 7, how great was the fall of it, is because it, it baffles a man. It humiliates a man to realize that all of his good works and that beautiful house that he had spent his lifetime building was nothing in the world but dung. If you'll notice in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Can you see that Paul came to the point in his life where he realized that his house was built upon the sand and on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter number 9, his house fell. And great was the fall of it. Paul changed his mind about what he thought was going to get him to heaven, touching the law blameless, and realized 
that it was totally Jesus Christ and none else. That's what true repentance is. Some people say we don't preach repentance over at the Faith Baptist Church. You just heard it preached. You need to change your mind about what you think will get you to heaven. Repentance is a word metanoia, which means a change of thought. You change your mind about what you think will get you to heaven and realize what Jesus did is sufficient when He died on Calvary for all of our dirty, rotten, wicked sins. Alright, we have the rocks and sand. we got the rags. Rags mentioned. The first time, and I'm going to go quickly, but the first time rags are mentioned is over in the book of Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 21. And they're connected with the drunkard and poverty and rags. In Jeremiah chapter number 38, verse number 11 and 12, rags are associated with a rotten piece of cloth, scrap or throw away. In Isaiah chapter number 64 and verse number 6, the Bible tells us that our good works are nothing but what? Filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. I challenge you to look up that word rags. That means totally corrupt. Our good works mentioned in Matthew chapter 7 when the preacher said he preaches, he cast out devils, and he's done many wonderful works. Jesus called these works corrupt or filthy rags in the book of Isaiah 64. That corrupt rag is something that lepers, they would tack up to a post. And since lepers, their, their limbs would rot off and they couldn't scratch themselves, they would go to that, that rag and they would try to scratch their back and that corrupt would rot, wipe off on the rag. Did you know that Jesus said that our works are like filthy rags in the sight of the Lord? I, I believe that everyone understands the meaning of rags. Rags suggest poverty, uncleanness, and rottenness. And God is telling us that it matters not how good we live, how clean we live, and how honest we are, and how upright that we may be. It makes no difference how much we give to the church and all we can do all of our lives add up to nothing better than dirty, filthy rags. And friend, if that's what you're depending on to get you to heaven, it's nothing but dirty, filthy rags. And I realize that in Sunday school we were preaching Christians ought to do right. But this text right here shows us that a man trying to incorporate good works to get him to heaven will never, never, never work. In Luke chapter number 15, we need to come to the Father like we are. Just like the prodigal did. And you know what He will do? What He'll do for you is He'll strip off the rags and He'll bring forth the best robe and He'll put it on you and He'll put shoes on your feet and He'll fill the banquet table with the best food that heaven has. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Heaven's best for earth's worst. So we have rocks we got sand. The rock and the sand and the rags and the leaves. Let's get to the leaves real quick and we're going to close. Leaves are beautiful, aren't they? Especially when God colors them in the fall. Now, I hadn't seen a whole lot of color down here in Florida. But uh, up in East Tennessee in the mountains, you can see a lot of color. He colors them in the fall. In the springtime, when the leaves appear... You know that cold and winter is over. And you'll find the first mention of leaves back in Genesis chapter 3 in verse number 7. And I know this is right. I got Deuteronomy wrong, but I know Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 is right. When Adam and Eve sinned, what they did is they went out and got some fig leaves, sewed them together and tried to cover up their nakedness. And then the Lord Jesus showed up walking in the garden. And He said, we hid. And the Lord asked Him, said, how did you know you're naked? You see, what they did is they tried putting on those good works to cover their sin. They tried to hide their good works. 
Did you know I preached it before? I believe there's people today all over this county, down here at Bells or J.C. Finney or somewhere, and the fashion of the day is still fig leaves. They may look a little different, but the fashion is still fig leaves. People are trying to cover up their sin, cover up their condition before Almighty God. But it'll never work. It'll never work. Only a blood sacrifice, only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can cleanse you and make you whole and clothe you with that pure robe of white. Amen? Now, what God said came true. Adam and Eve died spiritually. They thought that they could correct their mistake. And they tried to sew those fig leaves together, made aprons to put around their naked bodies. And that was just fine until God showed up. And you know, maybe a lot of you are resting in religion and you just think you may have it right until God shows up. Then you start feeling uneasy. You know that, let me, let me say this, and I'll, I'll stand by it when I say it. Every person that has made a false profession in the Lord Jesus Christ concerning salvation will always always doubt their salvation. They will. Because they're wondering if they put enough leaves on. That's right. They're wondering if they've added the right board to that house they built upon the sand. If they did it right. They're always wondering, have I done enough? But when you rest in the finished work of Christ, you realize that He is enough. Everything in Christ is right. God demanded a blood sacrifice. Jesus came. God became a man, went to Christ, went to Calvary. But before He went to Calvary, He was beaten brut brutally with a cat of nine tails. Scourged. Spit upon. Crown of thorns pushed down in the brow of His head. Blood. The Bible says in Isaiah 52 that his visage was marred more than any man. I've seen some terrible looking victims in accidents. As being a pastor, I've had to go to emergency rooms. I've had to go to burn units. And I've had to look upon those people, cry with them and cry with their family. But my Bible says that Christ's visage was marred more than any man. He took a beating for our sins. By His stripes we're healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and carried His cross all the way up to Calvary along Gabbatha with His blood pouring out as they nailed Him to the cross of Calvary shedding every drop of blood in Him for the remission of sins and then cried to a Holy Father. He said, it's finished. The work of redemption is done. And then remember what He said before that? Father, please forgive them. Amen. For they know not what they've done. Thank God. Will you today put aside all your preconceived notions and come to the Lord Jesus Christ? The choice is still yours. It's still the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ or it's an eternity in hell. Your religion may be beautiful to live by. It may be attractive. It may be in, even inviting. But if your religion is produced through the wisdom of man and by the labors of man's hands, your religion is empty. It's vain. It's corrupt. And it's going to fade as the leaves. So I beg you to come to Christ today. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet, please, if you will. Heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around. No one looking around.